Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a study has explored the importance of worms for the evolution of complex life, a new species of dinosaur has been discovered in China, humpback whales are even better hunters than we've realised, and more. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal PLOS Biology has found evidence that mitochondria and our brain cells are depositing their own DNA into the nucleic DNA of their cells. Most of the DNA in our bodies is found in the nucleus of our cells, but a small portion of our DNA is also found in the mitochondria and this DNA is only inherited from our mothers. Mitochondria manage energy production in our bodies and they may even be referred to as the powerhouse of the cell. Mitochondria derive from bacteria-like cells that merged with our single-celled ancestors long ago and kick-started another phase of evolution. As amazing as this was for us, it does mean that mitochondrial DNA is separate to the DNA that governs everything else, and that can occasionally be an issue. This study found that mitochondrial DNA in our brain cells is occasionally flung into the chromosomes in the nucleus of the cell, and the researchers aimed to find out what effect this had on our lifespan. They tested nearly 1,200 individuals and found that those that had some of this mitochondrial DNA in their brain cell chromosomes were more likely to have died at a younger age. This is an incredibly important bit of research into the idea of mitochondrial DNA infecting the nucleic DNA of our cells, which is a relatively recent discovery and something that will no doubt be worked on further in the future. Also in the recent news, some fascinating new discoveries about humpback whales have been made. Scientists have known for many years that one of the techniques used by humpbacks to feed is to produce a bubble net. They create these by swimming in a circle as they surface, releasing air from the blowhole. The rising bubbles form a vertical curtain that appear as one or more rings from above, and these curtains trap fish inside. However, it turns out that these bubble nets are much more complex than first thought. Observations on individually feeding humpback whales in Alaska have shown that the whales are able to control the net's three-dimensional form, such as the number of rings, the size and depth of the net, and the spacing between bubbles. The method enables them to capture up to seven times more prey in a single feeding dive, without using extra energy. It's well known that many animals use tools to help them find food, but very few animals are actually able to create or modify these tools themselves. This amazing insight into the formation and manipulation of bubble nets makes them one of the rare animals on our planet that can manufacture and wield their own tools. First up in the paleontology news for this week, a study has performed experiments on worms to understand how important these wonderful animals were to the evolution of complex life. That's right, we're getting a mini worm week. The research focuses on a key transitionary period in the history of our planet when the Ediacaran period became the Cambrian period about 538 million years ago. During this time, the nature of ecosystems permanently changed to be more animal dominated, with successive periods of evolutionary radiations and extinctions becoming the norm. One of the main things that might have helped to drive some of these changes is hypothesized to be the increase in so-called ecosystem engineering, in which organisms create, modify, or maintain their environment, and may also disturb the sediment by burrowing into it, known as bioturbation. Bioturbation in modern oceans is a very important process for maintaining ecosystems as it changes sediment structures, oxygenates the subsurface, and alters the chemistry of pore water. But how exactly did the increase in this behaviour affect ancient ecosystems over half a billion years ago? The researchers took a look at a group of worms which evolved from ancestors that first appeared in the Cambrian period and are still around today, the priapulid worms, also known as the penis worms, for reasons that are probably quite clear. The priapulids are relatively rare in seafloor ecosystems today, but their ancient relatives are known from many fossils in Cambrian deposits, indicating they were common components of the seabed back then, and they may even have been present in the older Ediacaran period too. The scientists observed the burrowing behaviours of modern priapulids in glass tanks to see how they disturbed the sediment and the structures they made. Since these worms are quite rare today, we actually didn't know much about their burrowing habits, and so these experiments have now taught scientists a lot about how the animals behave. As it turns out, their burrows are more complex than had been expected with linked burrow networks observed, and they also spent longer than expected in the burrows themselves. They also found that a type of trace fossil known from the Cambrian matches the structures of the burrows made by the modern worms, suggesting these ancient traces were made by similar creatures. More than that though, the observations as a whole suggest that priapulids played a more significant part than previously realised in bioturbating the Cambrian and potentially even the Ediacaran seabeds, 
improving the habitability of these environments for other organisms, and contributing to the major evolutionary and ecological shifts of this period of time. So, even more evidence that worms are fantastic creatures, and we should be very thankful for them. Life on Earth might have been very different if it weren't for the penis worms. And finally for the news this week, we welcome a new species of dinosaur from China. It's a new kind of hadrosauroid dinosaur, the diverse superfamily of herbivorous dinosaurs that include the so-called duck-billed dinosaurs, although they didn't really have duck bills. It's been named Chiangjungsaurus Changshengi, and it comes from a late Cretaceous formation, and though the precise age of the rocks is not known for certain, they likely date to sometime between 83 and 66 million years ago. It's known from a partial skeleton including most of the lower jaw, vertebrae, bits of the pelvic girdle, a good amount of the tail, and some partial hind limbs. This species likely grew to about 8 meters long, and there are many features of its bones indicating it's a unique species. It's found to be a non-hadrosauroid hadrosauroid, which sounds confusing, but basically means that although it's a member of the larger hadrosauroid superfamily, it's not part of the more derived hadrosaurid family. So it provides some interesting insight into the evolution of these groups, with Chianjongsaurus showing some transitional features of both. Comparing the geological formation that this new species came from to several other late Cretaceous age deposits in Asia, the paleontologists also found that the hadrosaurid species in those other paleoenvironments were likely moving between these places due to the similarities between species. So, lots of fascinating new things that we've learned about these dinosaurs at this time in the Cretaceous, thanks to this fossil. Well, that's it for the news this week. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. I just also wanted to give a quick life update, as I'm now very close to finishing my master's degree in paleontology, and so things have been very busy these past few weeks, and will continue to be for a few more. So just thank you for bearing with us, as we've kind of scaled back a little bit on a few videos. But I'm very excited to finish soon, and we have lots of exciting plans for what we're going to be doing with the channel, and specifically with seven days of science in the future. So keep watching for more on that in the next few months. Anyway, thank you again, and we'll see you next time.